If you are looking for a solid five channel system amplifier that has plenty of power available and incredible sound quality along with the full functionality of DSP control, the Audio Control D-5.1300 is for you. Hey guys, I'm Mark from the YouTube channel Car Audio Fabrication here today on behalf of Audio Control to show you guys this amplifier. What features does this amplifier have? How is it set up and installed? Let's take a look. So before we get into this right up front, I wanna point out to you guys that there are two very similar amplifiers in Audio Control's lineup. They have the LC-5.1300 and then this amp that we're obviously talking about, the D-5.1300. Now we did an overview video of the LC version a few months back and for the most part, these two amplifiers are very, very similar. They're both a five channel amplifier they have the same power rating, but the main difference is that the D version here has that DSP built in, whereas the LC version does not. As far as power ratings go, all of these power ratings here are in watts RMS. So it's 100 watts times four and 300 watts times one at four ohms or 200 watts times four and 500 watts times one at two ohms. Remember on these power ratings that Audio Control is a reputable company and they're listing these in Watts RMS. You know that you're gonna get this value. And this is a question that always comes up on five channel amplifiers. Yes, you could run your speakers at four ohms and you could run your subwoofer at two ohms or vice versa. You don't have to run the speakers at the same ohm load as the subwoofer. And don't forget, you can also bridge those channel pairs for 400 watts bridged at four ohms. Also worth noting, this amplifier is nice and compact at 12 inches wide, eight inches deep, and 2.1 inches tall. And just in case you're curious, the beverage of choice for this amplifier is the Miausa Double IPA. Let's see what we have inside the box here. We've got the amplifier itself, the quality control testing card, the manual, a USB cable, which we connect temporarily when we are tuning the amplifier DSP, the audio control guitar pick, and a hex key. This is pretty common for the audio control amplifiers. They have this cover plate that we can remove by loosening the two screws with the included hex key down here. This just covers up the top of the amplifier and gives it a nice clean look. And for on the analog amplifiers, it covers up a lot of the different dials and settings so you don't have to worry about anyone messing with them. But you'll notice that on this amplifier, there's really only one switch on top of the amplifier here. And the rest of the settings are all gonna be done via that USB cable on the computer. Let's do a test installation on this amplifier. Now, of course, when we install this, we wanna position it somewhere that it has plenty of space for ventilation along the different sides here so that it can properly cool itself. And we of course also want it to stay dry. Now we want to install in a location that we have nice, easy accessibility to all the different connections, which are all on one side. So that's nice, everything's all organized over here. And then there are four different mounting points that we're going to use to secure this in the vehicle. Our first wiring step is we're gonna connect our 12 volt constant and our ground wire. At minimum, you wanna use a four gauge size wire, but these do accept up to zero gauge. Next, we're gonna connect our remote turn on wire and this wire oftentimes comes from an aftermarket radio. But here's the thing, what if you're installing this amplifier into a vehicle that you're gonna keep using the stock radio? A lot of times the stock radio isn't going to have a remote turn on lead to tell the amplifier to turn on. So in that case, Audio Control has GTO Signal Sense, which stands for great turn on. With the GTO Signal Sense, if we turn this on, what the amplifier will do is it monitors inputs one and two on the speaker level inputs and once it detects a signal coming in, in other words, your factory radio is playing music, it tells the amplifier to turn on. And what's cool is you'll notice that this is labeled a remote in slash out. So the reason it says out is because if you're using that great turn on technology, now it will provide a 12 volt output that you can use from here and you could connect other amplifiers or other devices that you want to turn on with the audio system. For our testing purposes, we're gonna be using an aftermarket head unit. So I have a remote turn on lead that I can use. So I'm gonna turn that back to off. The next connection we need to make is we need to have a sound signal coming into the amplifier. Now there's two ways to do this. We can use the line level inputs. So these are these RCA wire connections. And most times you're gonna be using that when you have an aftermarket radio. 
The other option is bringing signal in with the speaker level inputs. And what this means is when we're using a factory car audio system, even if that factory car audio system already has an amplifier, we can bring the signal from that factory system into the amplifier by connecting those speaker wires here. This amplifier will accept up to 40 volts of input coming in on that input signal, which is worth noting because that allows us to use this, like I mentioned, with factory premium systems that already have an amp. Now again, for our example, we're using an aftermarket radio, so I'm gonna use those line level inputs, the RCA style connection. And this is a common question that comes up, and this is something I'll point out when we're talking about the software for tuning this amplifier. You can do what is called signal summing on this amp. As an example, let's say that your factory system has tweeters up on top of the dash and then it has a woofer down in the front doors. We might want to sum that signal for a full range signal. So what we could do is we could connect to both of those speaker level sources and in the software, we can sum that signal together. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is a lot of people think that, okay, you know, obviously I'm gonna be using this amplifier to power a subwoofer. So I have to have that subwoofer line level input coming out of my after market radio, but that's not the case. I'm intentionally only going to use this single pair of RCA inputs into the amplifier to show you guys in the software how I can actually use that same signal to provide signal for the subwoofer output. You'll also notice that this amplifier has some line outputs. And what these are for is if we wanted to send a signal to a separate amplifier. So as an example, let's say that we had another two channel amplifier that we wanted to power an additional set of speakers with, we could send the signal out of the amplifier and DSP control it in the DSP software. And remember that you don't necessarily have to be using the inputs from the line level in order to use the line level line outputs. You could have speaker level inputs providing the signal, and then you control everything with the DSP software and you can send a line level out. The next connection to make is the USB connection right here. I'm gonna leave this disconnected for the time being, but that's just so we can connect to our computer. Here we have a connection for the ACR3, which is our remote level control. This is sold separately from the amplifier, and the reason for that is you don't always have to have a remote level control, but in our case here, we wanna use it because we wanna be able to switch our presets by clicking in the button, and then we're also going to set it up so that we have independent base control on this knob. I'll show you guys how to do that, but you could also use this as a master volume control if you wanted to. That all goes into the DSP settings when we're tuning on the computer. Now we need to connect our speakers and we have four channels of output here. And what I love about the audio control amplifiers for the speakers is we can simply disconnect this plug and we can connect the speaker wires to that. It just makes things a lot easier when we have a plug since there are so many wires so close together. And finally, we also have our subwoofer wire connection. Just a reminder here that the minimum impedance on this amplifier is two ohms. The D-5.1300 also has audio controls option port right here. Now this is obviously not required, that's why it's called an option port, but you could use the audio control AC-BT24. This is a high resolution Bluetooth streamer that can also be used to tune the amplifier over Bluetooth. If you were going to use this, this plugs in just like that. So now that we have all of our connections made, let me show you guys what we're gonna be using to test this amplifier. So this is basically a car audio system outside of the car. You can see that it's all powered with a car battery. We have an aftermarket radio here. And then I have a component set here. So four speakers, what we're gonna do is I'm actually going to connect these speakers active. So I have channels one and two powering the tweeters and then channels three and four powering the woofers. And then over here we have a subwoofer that is connected to the subwoofer channel. Now again, remember this, I just want to emphasize that I'm using an aftermarket head unit, which you could of course use with this amplifier, but this amplifier is also set up so that you could use the factory head unit. If you were connecting to a factory head unit or a factory premium system that has an OEM amplifier, you can do so using those speaker level input. 
I've also connected that USB wire that we talked about earlier because now I have a laptop plugged in running the audio control software. You can download this on their website. This is the software for setting up the DSP inside the amplifier. So let's get into how we do all that setup and tuning. So when we first come into the software, we're gonna be greeted with this screen here where we need to put in a pin. Now by default, this pin is one, two, three, four, but we can set up a different pin in the software if we wanna protect our settings from being changed. So now that we've logged into the software, we're gonna start with looking at our inputs. Now remember earlier that we only connected our input signal to channels one and two. And you can see that each of these is labeled. So just for clarity's sake and to make some notes to myself, and since I know I'm not using any of these other inputs, I'm just going to mark them as not being used. Now I currently have all the outputs of the amplifier muted, that's why you can't hear anything playing, but here we can actually see the electrical signal that is coming into the amp. This is very advantageous, especially when it comes to using a factory audio system for the signal. We can see if the signal is bandwidth limited. I can kind of simulate this just by changing the settings on my aftermarket head unit, but as an example, you might connect to a factory speaker level signal and see something like this. And what this would tell you is that there's no base information on that signal. So this would be a bad signal to use if you're trying to get subwoofer bass because it doesn't exist. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is this amplifier has a testing tool built in that allows us to analyze that electrical signal. So in this case, I have a nice relatively flat signal from 25 Hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. With a factory audio system, you'd be more likely to see something like this where you have more peaks and valleys and that's because an equalization curve is applied to those factory speakers so that the OEM manufacturers can make those speakers sound a little bit better but obviously when we're upgrading this system, we want to get rid of some of that and I'm gonna show you how we can do that in a second. Also on our input screen here, we can control our input gain and don't forget that we can do all of this for each of these different inputs. Now we're not gonna see any signal coming in because I don't have any of these other inputs connected, but you guys get the idea. So now let's look at our outputs. So we're gonna to go to output view here and again, you'll notice right away that I have each of these outputs muted just so you guys can hear me talking and it's a good practice to mute all these outputs immediately before you turn up the volume on your source unit anyway, because we need to change things like our crossover settings and our levels. So first things first here for our adjustments, it's always a good practice to label what each of these is just to remind yourself. So I'm gonna do that now. I'll start with saying tweeters, woofers I've got labeled there and subwoofer. Now we need to tell the software where to get the signal for our tweeters from. So in this case, I'm gonna use channels one and two because that's my inputs. And this is where you could do some summing if you needed to. Let's say that our output for channels one and two was some coaxial speakers, so we needed more of a full range output. And let's say that we were using a factory OEM system to bring in the signal and we only had high signal coming in on one and two. We could add in three and four or five and six. You can do any combination of summing as need be. Now also in this box, we can activate the remote level control if we wanna use the ACR3 to control the levels of these channels. On these channels, I'm gonna leave it off. I'm also going to leave it off on channels three and four, but for the subwoofer, I wanna be able to control that level, so I'm gonna turn it on there. We know that we want our woofers fed from channels one and two because that's our only input. And then if we go to subwoofer, we also want that fed from one and two because again, our only input. If we were bridging any channels, we can mark them as mono here rather than left and right stereo. We can also again change the polarity and we can also link channels. What linking channels does is it allows us to use some of the same settings from outputs one and two to three and four. So you'll notice on our subwoofer output, we can't change it to mono because it's only one channel, so it automatically is mono. And again, you can't link that to any of the other channels. For crossovers, pretty self-explanatory here. We can use this slider or we can punch in a value like so. And we have the option to use a 12 dB per octave or 24 dB per octave on each one. We can also control the time delay of each of these channels. So this would be channel one, which is the left channel. We can just use the slider or we can input a value like so. And just in case you're not familiar with time delay, the purpose of that is in an audio system, an audio wave actually travels relatively slow, slow enough that you can actually hear the difference in arrival times. So what you're doing here is, let's say that your tweeter was 
40 inches away from the listening position on the left side, and let's say on the right side, it was 60 inches away, you would simply measure that to your exact listening position in the vehicle, punch in those values, and now it's gonna automatically delay this left tweeter sound so that it arrives at your listening position at the exact same time as your right tweeter. And whenever I mention that, the question always comes up, well, aren't you kind of messing with the sound for the passenger? And yes, that's the case, but what you can do is you can have different memory presets stored. Now, also on the output screen is Audio Control's proprietary AccuBase. This is something that you're gonna be more likely to set up on the subwoofer channel. And what this is for is a lot of times on a factory car audio system, when you turn up the volume, they will actually roll off the bass performance. They reduce it and they do that to protect their inexpensive stock speakers. But with the audio control AccuBase, what you can do is you can set this up so that as you turn up the volume, it actually brings that bass back into the signal, making sure that you don't have any of that bass roll off. So here on this screen, you can control that threshold and that level. And better yet, you can see when it's active with this active light here. Now, one of the most powerful aspects of having a DSP built into your amp, though, is being able to tune the equalizer here on each of the channels. So this is a 30-band equalizer right here, and right off the bat, we can see that channels 3 and 4 are currently linked. I'm going to click this here so that I can modify just channel 3 on its own EQ, and then we could do a separate channel four on its own EQ as well. So right now we are looking at the woofer channel, channel number three, and just as a reminder, we have a crossover set on this from 80 hertz up to 4,500 hertz. And what we can see here is remember, this is the electrical signal coming in. I intentionally messed up the settings on the aftermarket head unit that's feeding signal into the amplifier, just so we could do an example here. Because remember, a lot of times on a stock system, this is what your signal is gonna look like. It's gonna be all over the place. So to correct it, what we can do is we can click auto EQ here, we can read the warning there and then click yes. And what this is going to do is it's going to try to correct that signal to make it flat. You can see that the auto EQ only affects what's within the range of information that you're using based on the crossover settings. And you can also see that it intentionally doesn't apply too much boost. Now we can of course come in here and adjust our settings on our own if we'd like to. It looks like we're a little hot here on the 160 Hertz. So I'll bring it down a little bit more and keep in mind, these are always going to be bouncing around a little bit just due to the sampling rate. I might bring this up around 500 just a little bit, but you can see now we have more of a corrected electrical signal to work with. Now keep in mind, this is only the electrical signal. Once you actually get into the vehicle and use an acoustic RTA, you're using a measurement microphone to measure the acoustic signal, you're going to want to modify each of these bands even more to match whatever your target is for your RTA listening. A newer feature to the audio control software is they've added where we can store a setting. So let's go ahead and store memory one. And what that allows us to do is when we come over to, let's say our right speaker, and we wanna be able to match our right speaker to what our left speaker was, we can recall one of the measurements and we can see it ghosted in the background there so that we can try to match our new right side measurement to our left side measurement. Once we're happy with our settings, we can save it to a memory and this whole time we've been working on memory one. That's why it's this light gray color. To save it, we're going to click and hold our left mouse button and then we can say, yes, we want to overwrite those settings. Now to change our settings for a different memory, we can just click that memory. So now we are in memory number two and we can make all of our changes and then same thing, we'll click and hold in order to save those settings. And you can use the different memories for several different things. Like I mentioned earlier, you could use them for a primary driver's seat tune or if you had two people in the vehicle. Another thing you could do is if you wanted to have this memory one be driven off your normal head unit and if you wanted a separate input to provide signal, let's say you were using a high res player or something like that, you could set it up so now all of these outputs are driven from inputs seven and eight. That would also apply if you wanted to use something like that AC-BT24 high res streamer we were talking about earlier. 
Lots of different options there. Personally, I only find myself ever using one or two memories, but there are four if you need them. It's worth noting the crossover settings always change the same regardless of what setting you are using. An idea here is that it prevents you from accidentally changing to a preset where the crossovers change and destroy your speakers. The final setting to look at here is the dashboard view. And personally, I don't find myself using this view all too often, but this is just kind of a different layout that includes a lot of the same information from the input view and output view that we were talking about earlier. Mainly, now you can see the input RTA and the output RTA at the same time. We wanna do a little bit of an audio test, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute each of these outputs so that we can take a listen. This amplifier definitely sounds great and has plenty of power and so much tuning control with that DSP being built in. To learn more about the Audio Control D-5.1300, you guys can check out the links down in the video description. Once again, I am Mark from the YouTube channel Car Audio Fabrication here on behalf of Audio Control, and thank you guys for watching.